Well, welcome to this last session on topology and general relativity. Uh, I apologize in advance. This, this talk's a little more topology intensive than, than previous ones. And for those of you uh, not so familiar with things like fundamental groups and covering spaces, I hope you can still appreciate uh, some of the results we're going to talk about. Um, so here's, here's our list of topics. Uh, we're in part two. And uh, yesterday, we talked about the topology of black holes. And now we want to talk about the topology of the region of space outside all black holes. That's where we live. Okay? And uh, we want to motivate this. And the motivation here comes from the notion of topological censorship. We're on the wrong page. Uh, now I've overshot. There we go. The topology of the region of space exterior to black holes. Um, the motivation here comes from the notion of topological censorship. Now, in principle, the topology of space uh, can be very complicated, but uh, general relativity really permits quite, uh, quite uh, diverse topologies. In, in fact, uh, let me paraphrase a result of Eisenberg, Maseo, and Pollock. Uh, there exist vacuum solutions to the Einstein equations with asymptotically flat Cauchy surfaces of arbitrary topology. Uh, but topological censorship has to do with the idea that such non-trivial topology should somehow end up behind the event horizon. And outside, the topology should be simple. And there, the, the, the rationale is rough, roughly as follows for this. Uh, we mentioned last time this theorem of Gannon and Lee that suggests non-trivial topology tends to induce gravitational collapse. And then in the standard collapse scenario, the process of gravitational collapse leads to the formation uh, of an event horizon which, which shields the singularity from view. This is, uh, and then according to the notion of topological censorship, this non-trivial topology that induced this collapse itself ends up behind uh, the event horizon. And this circle of ideas was formalized by the topological censorship theorem of Friedman, Schleich, and Witt, which says in physical terms that observers outside the event horizon are unable to probe non-trivial topology. I won't say explicitly what that means. Uh, more formally, their theorem applies to asymptotically flat, asymptotically Minkowski in spacetimes. These are spacetimes that have an asymptotic structure similar to Minkowski space. They admit uh, a past and future null infinity. So here's again this sort of Penrose type diagram for a black hole. So their result applies to observers that, that travel out here in the domain of outer communication. That's the region outside of all black holes and, and white holes if there are any. Uh, sub subsequent to their work, I was able to uh, strengthen their result uh, uh, by obtaining a purely uh, topological conclusion. And so we have the following theorem. Let M be an asymptotically flat space-time. And suppose that the domain of outer communications, this region outside of all black holes and white holes, if there are any, is globally hyperbolic and satisfies the null energy condition. Then the domain of outer communications is simply connected. Uh, so this is, in some sense, the most basic form of topological censorship, uh, not a trivial topology at the level of the fundamental group. And by the way, this was first proved by Crucial and Wald in the, in the stationary case. Um, but these results and, and other results that support the notion of topological censorship uh, are space-time results. They involve assumptions that are essentially global in time. And it's a very uh, difficult question, important question, to determine, to determine whether a given initial data set gives rise via evolution by the Einstein equations to this space time that satisfies these global in time conditions. So, uh, uh, so the aim of uh, more recent work with Michael Eichmeier and Dan Pollack was to attain a result supportive 
of the notion of topological censorship, but purely at the initial data level, thereby circumventing these very difficult, granted important issues of, of uh, global evolution. And so uh, let, me, let me sort of set up, set up the result we want to consider. Um, here's a, a schematic Penrose-type diagram of a black hole. And uh, we want to try to, uh, we want to indicate uh, the conditions we want to have for an initial data version of topological censorship. So uh, we, for our initial data manifold, we should think of it uh, as representing uh, an asymptotically flat slice in the domain of outer communications whose boundary there corresponds to a cross section of the event horizon. And then at the initial data level, we represent this cross section by a marginally outer trapped surface. Okay. Now, as we discussed yesterday, in, in this domain of outer communication, this region outside of all black holes and, and white holes, uh, you can't have any outer trapped surfaces. In fact, you can't have any marginally outer trap surfaces. There are, there are arguments that prevent that. Uh, in fact, you can't have any immersed marginally outer trap surfaces. Now, I haven't talked about what an immersed MOTS is. Uh, it's a slight generalization of the notion of MOTS, and I'll say a little bit more about it later. But it's OK to sort of just think MOTS. Um, and, and so we're actually going to. Uh, this, uh, this property of the domain of outer communication, we're going to adopt this as a condition on our initial data slice here. We're going to assume that there are no MOTs or no immersed MOTs in the exterior region, namely on V outside the uh, boundary, MOTs boundary of V. So these, these are the uh, conditions that uh, um, uh, naturally lead to a uh, statement of an initial data version of topological censorship. And so here's, here's the theorem. This is in three dimensions. This is in three dimensions. Uh, let VHK be a three-dimensional, asymptotically flat initial data set, such that V is a manifold with boundary, whose boundary is a com the compact is uh, redundant. Uh, MOTs, by definition, are compact in, in, our, in our framework, whose boundary is a MOTs. Then if there are no MOTs or no immersed MOTs away from the boundary, then the topology of V is as simple as possible. It's R3 minus a ball. Okay. So this captures the notion of topological censorship, uh, that the topology outside the event horizon is simple. And in three dimensions, it's as, it's as simple as can be. And let me make a few remarks uh, about the proof. Uh, the proof makes uh, use of very powerful existence results for MOTS um, uh, due to Shane and Anderson and Metzger and Eichmeier. And I'll, I'll say a few more words about this in a moment. Uh, the proof also makes use of an important consequence of geometrization, that is, the positive resolution of Thurston's geometric uh, uh, geometrization conjecture. Namely, that the fundamental group of every compact three-manifold is residually finite. Uh, now, I'm not going to say what residual finiteness is, but it implies the following, and this is what we need, that every compact three-manifold with non-trivial, uh, uh, in particular, with non-trivial fundamental group, admits uh, a finite uh, non-trivial cover. So uh, the fundamental group's non-trivial. There exists a finite non-trivial cover. For example, think of the, the three torus. The three torus, the universal cover, that's an infinite cover. But nevertheless, the three torus admits a lot of finite covers. And this is, this is a feature of, uh, of um, uh, residual finiteness and applies to all, all compact three manifolds. Uh, notice that there's no curvature condition. Dominant energy conditions not required. There are no curvature conditions. So in some sense, this is a, a purely topological result. Uh, on the other hand, the asymptotic flatness, the asymptotic flatness uh, is, is essential to the proof. And you might say that there's, there's an implicit uh, 
curvature or any energy condition in this, in that we're assuming there's, there's no MOTS or immersed MOTS in V, and uh, that was motivated by a result in the full space-time setting that actually requires a, an energy condition. Um, but, but, uh, uh, but, but again, this, as, as, as it's set up here, this is essentially a, top, uh, a topological result, and the, the moral is that uh, MOTS detect non-trivial topology. And if there's no MOTS, there's no topology. And this is reminiscent of how minimal surfaces have been used in Riemannian geometry to detect non-trivial topology. And I, I have in mind in particular these classical results of, of Meek, Simon, and Yao. So I want to talk, uh, so this is the theorem. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about its proof. As, uh, as I said, it makes, it makes use of uh, a, an important uh, existence result for MOTS. And so here's, here's the basic existence result for MOTS. And uh, it says the following. Let WN be a connected compact manifold with boundary and an initial data set V and HK. Notice there's a dimension restriction. Uh, and suppose that the boundary can be written as a disjoint union, sigma in union sigma out. So here's, here's our compact body W. Here's sigma in. I sort of think of that as an interior boundary, and then sigma out as an exterior boundary. And suppose that the null expansion at sigma in, the null expansion uh, with respect to the null normal pointing into the W is negative, uh, uh, and that at sigma out, the null expansion with respect to this outward null normal is positive. Okay, so these are sort of the boundary conditions. Then necessarily, there's a MOTS in the middle that separates sigma in from sigma out. Okay? It almost looks like the intermediate value theorem, but actually, there's more involved. Um, I just want to say a few words about the proof. Uh, just uh, it's because it's an it's an interesting story. See, in the in the time symmetric case, uh, second fundamental form vanishes. We're just talking about the existence of minimal surfaces, and then in this setup, uh, then you can just use you know well known variational techniques. You can simply minimize area in an appropriate homology class. And uh, the regularity theory of geometric measure theory guarantees that you get this smooth minimal surface. But you see, in general, in the case of MOTS, in general, there's no, uh, there's no variational principle. MOTS, there's no uh, approach via variational techniques. MOTS aren't known to be the stationary point of some uh, action like, like area or functional like area. So in fact, an entirely uh, different proof is needed to establish the existence of MOTS under these, uh, under these conditions. And uh, the proof, well, let me just uh, say a few words about this. We have this existence result. I just want to tell you just a little bit about uh, the, the development of, of the existence, uh, the proof of existence. Now, in the proof of Shane and Yao, the positive mass theorem in the general non-time symmetric case, they uh, studied in detail existence and regularity properties of Jang's equation. It, uh, and it was solutions to Jang's equation that essentially enabled them to reduce the general non-time symmetric case to the time symmetric case. Uh, they interpreted Jang's equation uh, as a uh, uh, prescribed mean curvature equation of sorts. And in their analysis, they, they discovered and they showed that the only obstruction, the only obstruction to global existence of Jang's equation under appropriate uh, uh, boundary conditions are MOTS in the initial data. The only thing that could cause problems are MOTS in the initial data, and they, they had to deal with that problem. Um, uh, so this was certainly a complication in, the, in their proof. But, but as, as uh, Rick described at this meeting, 2004 Miami Waves conference, one can turn this drawback actually into a feature. And one can actually establish the existence of MOTS by uh, considering solutions, by forcing solutions to blow up. You force solutions of Jang's equation to blow up. It's a cylindrical blow up. And when you project down, that's where MOTS is. Uh, 
So it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting approach to existence, completely different from the minimal surface case. Um, and detailed proofs were given uh, by Anderson and Metzger in three dimensions and by Eichmeier up to, say, seven dimensions. Uh, uh, Eichmeier's uh, uh, proof requires, uh, he develops a very uh, strong regularity theory based on uh, results from geometric measure theory. That's, that's where the dimension seven comes in again. There's a really nice uh, survey article by Anderson, Eichmeier, and Metzger uh, where these things are discussed in a very nice way. Exist, uh, MOTS, properties of MOTS, and relationship to solutions to Jang's equation. Anyway, so we have this, we have this existence, we have this existence result for, uh, uh, for MOTS. Uh, I suppose I should tell you what an immersed MOTS is. Um, there's a general, uh, first of all, MOTS were defined to be embedded and two-sided. But there is a general notion of an immersed MOTS. Whenever you have an immersion of a surface, say, into, into a three-dimensional space-like hypersurface, a two-sided two immersion uh, into a three-dimensional space-like hypersurface, uh, you can ask whether that is an immersed MOTS. This, is, this makes sense. But in fact, um, but in fact we need uh, a, a, a much more special uh, notion uh, or require just a, a much more special notion of immersed MOTS, uh, which is described here on this slide. Um, so in our statement of the theorem, we're only assuming that uh, these immersed MOTS do not exist out in the exterior region. Okay. So uh, this slide describes what an immersed MOTS is. There's the definition, and there's an example. But actually, I think, uh, and so you can read that, but I think uh, you, can see, you can see from the proof what is meant by an immersed MOTS. It will come out in the proof. Uh, and so let's, let's consider the proof. Now, I'm actually going to consider a special case, the no horizon case. So we have an asymptotically flat initial data set, VHK, VHK where V uh, uh, is asymptotically flat. It doesn't have any boundary. It's just a simplification in the proof. Okay. With boundary, you need to modify the proof a little bit, but it's still somewhat similar in spirit. So here's how the proof goes. By the assumption of asymptotic flatness, we can write V as a connected sum, R3 connected sum N where n is a closed, compact without man, closed without, bound, uh, closed without boundary, three manifold, okay? Because the end is just, is just R3, R3, is just uh, R cross and S2. We can write V as a connected sum in this way. And the goal is to show that this compact part is simply connected, has trivial fundamental group. Well, suppose it doesn't. Suppose pi 1 of n is non-trivial. Then by the residual finiteness for fundamental groups of compact three manifolds, n admits a finite non-trivial cover. But if n admits a finite non-trivial cover, it's, not, it's easy to see that v itself admits a finite non-trivial cover. So we're in our, uh, uh, we're in our asymptotically flat space-like hypersurface. And we pass to a finite non-trivial cover. Now, the asymptotically flat end of V will lift up into this cover. The, uh, the cover V tilde will have now finitely many ends. And the number of ends is just equal to the, the degree, just equal to the degree of the cover. So we can label some of those. So, so, uh, um, so uh, then we're going to truncate. So we, here in this picture, we have four asymptotically flat ends, and we truncate those to get this compact body W with manifold. And so uh, W, by truncating the ends, W is a manifold with multiple boundary components. And we can label some of them as sigma in and some of them as sigma out. 
Now, if you take these truncations sufficiently far out on the asymptotically flat end, uh, just, by, just by the prop basic properties of asymptotic flatness, uh, the barrier conditions for the, uh, for the uh, existence result for MOTS will apply. So by taking, taking these uh, truncations sufficiently far out on sigma n, we're going to have theta plus negative with respect to the, the null normal pointing in. And taking the truncation sufficiently far out here, we're going to have theta plus positive. This is just a feature of asymptotic flatness on those large radial spheres out near infinity. So we know by the basic, we know by the basic existence result that there, ah, I didn't update, that there, there exists the MOTS. There it is. There exists the MOTS here and uh, up in this covering space. And then you take that MOTS and you project it down into V itself by the covering map. That's an immersion of a MOTS. And the image, is, the image under that immersion is exactly what we mean by an immersed MOTS. Okay? So the existence of a MOTS in the covering space implies the existence of immersed MOTS in V itself. But we're assuming there are no immersed MOTS. Okay? So we arrive at a contradiction. So in fact, the fundamental group of N must be trivial. OK, we, well, there's some heavy hitting here. Uh, since the fundamental group of n is trivial, it, in fact, uh, must be a three-sphere by uh, the positive resolution of the Poincaré conjecture. So v itself is r3 connected some s3. So v is diffeomorphic to r3. Okay. So this is, this is the result. <laughs> Um, okay, what about higher dimensions? Uh, in, in more recent work uh, with Anderson, Dahl, and Pollock, we've taken an entirely different approach to uh, the study of the topology of the exterior region. Uh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to flash this slide up. Um, in this, in this result, uh, dot the dominant energies condition. Uh, so we're, we're dealing with uh, initial data sets VHK, where the dimension of V is between 3 and 7. Uh, now we require an energy condition. We require that the dominant energy condition holds. And uh, we assume uh, that the boundary of V is a MOTS. And we assume that there are no MOTS in the exterior region. Notice I didn't say immersed MOTS here, just no regular MOTS in the, in the exterior region. This is a weaker condition. Then we're able to produce, you take, here's your asymptotically flat initial data manifold. We're able, uh, you consider the one point compactification of that, compactify that point at infinity on the end, and call that V prime. And we're able to produce a metric of positive scalar curvature uh, on this one point compactification, having certain nice properties. And, uh, Again, the idea is once you have positive scalar curvature, then you can use various results uh, from the liter uh, literature on manifolds of positive scalar curvature. Now we have a boundary um, using uh, index theory uh, obstructions, minimal surface obstructions, to obtain, to obtain restrictions on, on the topology of V prime and hence on the topology of V. Um, um, I'll, I'm going to probably be saying more about that next week. Okay. So, so, uh, so uh, these are the results I wanted to talk about concerning the topology of the exterior region, uh, region exterior to to black holes. Now, now I want to switch gears into sort of the last last topic. Um, in our outline, let's switch to cosmology. Okay? So we're getting away from isolated gravitating systems to now cosmology. And uh, so we want to consider now 
cosmological spacetimes, which I mean here by uh, globally hyperbolic spacetimes with compact Cauchy surfaces. And we want to consider models of cosmological spacetimes uh, which uh, obey the Einstein equations with positive cosmological, pos positive cosmological constant. So any energy conditions we impose, we want them to be consistent with a positive cosmological constant and consistent with current observations that, in fact, the cosmological constant is positive. And in this discussion, uh, we're restricting to dimensions 3 plus 1. Now, Hawking's classical cosmologic, uh, cosmological singularity theorem establishes past time-like uh, in geodesic incompleteness in spatially closed space times that at some point are expanding towards the future. Uh, but his, his theorem requires the Ricci tensor of space-time to, to satisfy the, the strong energy condition, that Ricci is non-negative for all time-like vectors x. But if you take the Einstein equation now with cosmological constant, you easily compute that Ricci on a time-like vector is equal to this expression. And we can see in particular if uh, we can see in the situation that we're considering where the cosmological constant is positive, that in general, the strong energy condition will be violated in space times satisfying uh, the Einstein equation with positive cosmological constant. So in general, the strong energy condition won't be satisfied if land is positive. And indeed, the conclusion of Hawking's theorem won't hold in general. And a, a, an immediate example is, is de Sitter space. So uh, de Sitter space is a geodesically complete spacetime of, of constant curvature. It's a vacuum solution to the Einstein equation, and his, its Ricci tensor is given by the following. It's a Einstein space. Ricci is equal to lambda times g. So you can see right away for de Sitter space, if you put in a time, if you evaluate in a time-like vector, you're going to get a, a negative quantity on the right-hand side. The strong energy condition simply doesn't hold. Uh, and on the other hand, notice, if you put in a, a null vector, put in a pair of null vectors, you get zero on the right-hand side. Okay. So in, ge in general, the null en energy condition is, is compatible with a positive cosmological constant. In fact, the null energy condition is insensitive to the sign of the cosmological constant. Um, uh, just a little picture of de Sitter space could be represented as a hyperboloid of one sheet in Minkowski space. And it can be expressed in global coordinates as follows. R cross S3 with this uh, warp product metric. And far enough to the future, the uh, universe is expanding towards the future. Uh, nevertheless, this space time is past time like geodesically com complete. In fact, it's geodesically complete. Um, there are some other examples of future expanding, of a physical interest of future expanding cosmological models um, that can be uh, past, uh, past time like geodesically complete. So I want to look at, look at the Friedman models, the FLRW models, for some further examples. So here's the models we're looking at. Our, our manifold is zero to infinity cross a compact three-manifold sigma. Here is the metric, the standard warp product metric on FLRW models. And we're in, we're at d sigma k squared is a metric of uh, constant curvature, either k equal minus 1, 0, or plus 1. Okay. Um, so these examples are further examples, along with the de Sitter example. But now, now topology, topology enters the picture. Um, these three cases are topologically quite distinct. Sigma is compact uh, with uh, carrying this metric of curvature minus 1, 0, or plus 1. In the k equal plus 1 case, that's a spherical space, the fundamental group is finite. But uh, in the case of k equals 0 or minus 1, this is the toroidal or hyperboloidal case, the fundamental group, the fundamental group uh, is infinite. 
So there's a, a distinct topological difference between the k equal plus one case and the k equal zero and one case. So let's, let's solve the Einstein equations. Let's assume that, the, that we have a collisionless perfect fluid or a dust. So that's an energy momentum tensor of this form where rho of t is the density and d by dt is the fluid four velocity. Then one can solve, one can solve the Einstein equations with positive, constant, positive cosmological constant and analyze the behavior of uh, the scale factor r of t. So here's, here's a part of a, a diagram from Ray D'Inverno's nice book on introducing Einstein's relativity. It's showing the behavior of the scale factor uh, uh, to solutions of these FLRW models in the case of a positive cosmological constant. Now notice in the case k equal minus one and the case k equal zero, uh, r, goes to, uh, r goes to zero to the past. That is, these models all have a big bang, all have a, a, a big bang beginning where r, r, r is zero. Um, but in, something happens dif differently in the case k equal plus one. There are various scenarios for the scale factor, but in fact, there's, there's a, a range where r looks like this, where r doesn't go to zero, uh, and where in fact the model, the FLRW model, is time-like geodesically complete to the past. Uh, there's a mass parameter in these models. When that mass parameter is sufficiently small relative to the size of the cosmological constant, you can indeed get this De Sitter-like past completeness in the FLRW models having spherical topology. So what we observe is that uh, only in the k equal plus one case that the past Big Bang singularity can be avoided. Uh, but it turns out that this behavior holds, holds, in a much, holds in a much broader context. And so this is a, a recent result with my student, Eric Ling, uh, says the following. Suppose V is a smooth, compact, space-like Cauchy surface in a three plus one dimensional space-time that satisfies the null energy condition. Uh, Suppose further that V is expanding in all directions. So we have our compact Cauchy surface. There, say, is the unit normal. We're assuming that it's expanding in all dimensions. Uh, this is a condition on the second fundamental form. And uh, our conventions are I think our opposite Justin Corvino's and also opposite uh, David Feynman's. Um, so you take the covariant derivative of the unit normal in the direction x uh, and dot it into the direction y. Then the condition that the condition that v is expanding in all condition in all directions is the condition that uh, the second fundamental form is positive definite. Is positive definite. Um, to, to motivate this a little bit, if you take a unit vector tangent to x and uh, extend it along the geodesic flow, uh, just uh, make it invariant under the, the, the normal geodesics to V for a short time, short proper time along the geodesics. Uh, and then you look at the length of X, G of X dot X square root, then a simple computation shows that KXX is equal to uh, the derivative with respect to proper time along these normal geodesics uh, of the length of x evaluated at t equals zero. Okay? So when you assume 
that the second fundamental form is positive definite, you're assuming that these lengths are increasing towards the future, and uh, that's, what, uh, that's how we capture the notion of v being expanding uh, in all directions. Um, the, the result in Hawking's theorem is that uh, is weaker. It's the, the, the trace of the second fundamental form is positive. Okay, so it's average expanding. This is expanding in all directions. Okay, so what do we have? We have a smooth, compact space like Cauchy surface three, in a three plus one dimensional space time satisfying the null energy condition. And suppose further that V is expanding. V is expanding in all directions. Um, then either V is a, is a spherical space, and by a spherical space, I mean the three sphere itself or a quotient of the three sphere. Typical examples, again, are the three sphere itself or, or lens spaces or Poincare dodecahedral space. There's a complete classification of these spherical spaces. Then either V is a spherical space or M is passional geodesically complete. Okay. So this generalizes the behavior that we uh, observed in these Friedman models with positive cosmological constants. Yes. No, every, as sorry. Oh, yeah, topologically. Right. They, these are topologically right. spherical spaces. They're, they're diffeomorphic to S3 or quotients of S3. Right, right. No not a geometric, a topological. Right. Um, so uh, by taking quotients of de Sitter space, by taking quotients of de Sitter space, you can, in fact, can construct... Uh, geodesically complete space times whose Cauchy surfaces have arbitrary, arbitrary uh, spherical space topology, which are past time like geodesically complete. Um, on the other hand, you can view this, you can view this um, uh, as a singularity theorem. Uh, you can view it that way. And, and in that case, the conclusion would be if V is anything else but a spherical space, then space-time must be past time-like, but must be past null geodesically incomplete. Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking more about this next week. Um, this proposition here uh, is a special case of the theorem, um, and it's also uh, used in the proof in a couple of different places. And it's actually, this result, um, uh, this result more or less essentially appears in an, in an older paper of mine with, uh, with Lars Anderson. Um, and so it says the following, essentially the same hypotheses. If uh, M is a three plus one dimensional globally hyperbolic space time that satisfies the null energy condition, V is an orientable, smooth, compact space like Cauchy surface in MG that is expanding in all directions then a V has non-trivial second homology class. M must be past null geodesically complete. The proof is kind of an interesting story, but it's been a long week. C comment? Uh, it's been a long week, and uh, there's some nice pictures here, and, I'll, and a nice exercise. There's a nice exercise there. Get, you get the trap service you, for free because, it, yeah. because exactly, exactly. He just gave the proof. Okay, you gave away the exercise. <laughs> okay. Um, right. If if the second homology is non-trivial, then you can minimize area in a homology class. This gives you a minimal surface uh, embedded. Um, um, necessarily uh, non-separating, otherwise it would be hom homologically trivial. There it is. So geometric measure theory gives us this embedded non-separating minimal surface, suggested as it is by this picture. Uh, but we're not in a position, and the null energy condition holds, but we're not in a position yet to apply the Penrose singularity theorem. 
Why not? We want to apply the Penrose Singularity Theorem. Oh, uh, as you observe, we have a minimal surface in uh, a space-like hypersurface that's expanding in all directions towards the future. Well, if that means towards the past, it's contracting in all directions towards the future. Then <laughs> there, it's a nice exercise to show that that is a past trap surface. So you have the minimal surface in a space-like slice that's expanding in all directions. It's actually past trapped. So we have the null energy condition. We have a past trap surface. We want to apply the Penrose Singularity Theorem, but we can't yet. How come? There's one essential, one, one essential hypothesis that's not satisfied from Penrose Singularity Theorem that's not satisfied. So the Penrose Singularity Theorem, if you remember, requires a non-compact Cauchy surface. We've got a compact Cauchy surface. Okay. So it requires passing to a covering space-time that has a non-compact Cauchy surface and past trap surfaces. And that's what this slide is all about. So we can pass, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to more discussion of the proof than I had intended, but we can pass uh, by unraveling, unraveling, making a cut along sigma, you obtain, obtain a manifold with two boundary components and you can sort of glue them end to end to get a covering, an, uh, a non-compact covering, V tilde of V, uh, there will be a covering spacetime, a spacetime M tilde covering M, with, uh, hat, which has V tilde as, its, uh, uh, as a Cauchy surface. Um, all the local geometry, all the local geometry lifts um, under the uh, covering map by pulling back via the covering map. And, uh, and so these two spheres lift to trapped two spheres up in this uh, covering space time with non-compact Cauchy surface, which satisfies the null energy condition. So by Penrose Singularity Theorem applied to this covering space time, this covering space time must be past null geodesically complete. And so uh, that implies by projecting down into the covering map that the original space time is past null geodesically complete. Um, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a spe special case of, of this uh, general theorem, and it's actually, uh, it's actually uh, used uh, as a lemma in the full, full, uh, full proof of the theorem. Again, um, the full proof of this theorem requires uh, some recent uh, advances in the uh, topology of th three manifolds. Again, that required geometrization conjecture to be solved before before uh, one could really get this result. I'm actually going to talk more about this next week as well. Thank you very much.